of the top 100,000 websites in the world in terms of traffic, 45% of those use the WordPress platform. So narrow this down to the top 10,000 websites and the figure lifts to 49% and increasing. The closest competitor to the world's most popular content management platform is Drupal with just over 7% of the market share. And that's teetering on decline. In addition to my role as the Managing Director of Illustrate Digital, the user experience and WordPress development agency for ambitious brands, I'm also involved with a marketing team at WordPress. I get to see and work on some of the key driving forces behind the success of the world's most popular content management platform. And I get to understand what, it, what makes it such a crucial tool for marketers across the world when producing successful web builds and campaigns. This pursuit of knowledge and how to design the best experiences and engineer the most useful functionalities has taken my team all across the UK, Europe and even America in search of the answer to every marketer's desires. We've tested platforms, developed technologies and designed more websites than you can shake a stick at. So it may be fair to say that we know a little bit about the content management space. But my ultimate question is, what do the majority of the top 100,000 or top 10,000 brands in the world know that we can learn from today? There's got to be a reason that the highest performing websites perform as well as they do whilst using a completely free CMS. So we're going to explore the top 20 things that every marketer needs to have or should benefit from when it comes to their content management platform. I'm also going to pose another question, which is this. Whether you should use WordPress, Sitecore, Umbraco, Drupal or any other serious content management platform. And should it be the only platform you are using? Does one size fit all? Does one platform suit every need or is a blended approach operated by your marketing department with a desire for flexibility? the best way to achieve results, success, ROI in the world of digital. So I've promised you the top 20 hits of our time in marketing. Let's get stuck in. Number one, a clear intentional navigation. This could possibly be the most obvious of all of my points. If people arrive at your website or your campaign landing page and can't find the content they're looking for or the information that interests them, then you've already begun a losing battle. As a marketer, it's your responsibility to plan out your content in advance and to understand the route your users may want to take to find that content. It's your content platform's responsibility and equally your web agency's responsibility to make sure that your navigation is accessible both on the front end for your website visitors and in the back end for content managers. An intuitive, easy to manage interface to update your navigation as your brand evolves is absolutely crucial. Number two, even clearer mobile navigation. Just to hammer home the first point, but also to draw your attention to different device sizes, you really need to aim for even clearer and even more intuitive navigation on mobile and tablet devices. Here is where you need to be a little bit more careful, especially if your website houses a lot of content. Don't allow the navigation to go too deep on mobile. That little side menu can get a little bit too fiddly when you get two or three, step, uh, three options deep. I'm not saying you need to miss content out, but what I am saying is you need to consider driving your user to a page to allow them to navigate further rather than simply replicating the mega menu that you have uh, that you may have at a full screen resolution. I think I could safely bet that the majority of people watching this talk will work in a brand that has a majority mobile audience. Therefore, it's even more important that you give due attention to mobile devices. It's also well known that the attention span of people using mobile phones to browse websites is far lower when compared to desktop users. This means it's even more important to keep the navigation quick and simple, but with the ultimate aim of getting people to the content they're looking for in the shortest possible time. 
Number three, intuitive horizontal scroll on mobile. Again, just to focus on um, how someone experiences your content on smaller devices, Websites built in 2020 onwards should really be considering horizontal scroll on mobile devices. What do I actually mean by that? Well, you've definitely visited a website in the past on your mobile and it's felt like a never ending scrolling experience. If people have to scroll really far to find the content, especially factoring in short tension spans, you are very likely going to lose them. Organising the experience by content type is a really good way to give the user more control over whether they explore the content further or continue scrolling to find more of your content. It's actually a misnomer that you may want to take control from the user. It speaks of mistrust in, in my experience. On the flip side, handing control to your user subconsciously shows the care that you've given towards personalising the relationship with your site with your content and with your brand. Number four, content flow. Once you've gotten people to the content they want to see, what happens next? Well, if we're talking about successful marketing, then and obviously we are, one of the two things, uh, one of two things in particular is going to happen. Either your website visitor is so engaged in that content that they, they fill out a contact form, reach out to you or purchase one of your products, or, and this is much more likely, they see the need to get a little bit more information before they're totally convinced. So let's look at two scenarios really quickly. The first scenario is an e-commerce website selling high-end fashion. Your visitor successfully navigates from menswear to shoes, shoes to brown brogues, and from this category, they open a product that they, that they like the look of. Is the journey complete? The chances are the first product they've looked at isn't the product they'll actually buy, at least not straight away. So you show them other brown brogues they may like to see. They browse through several pairs of shoes before deciding upon the one that they, they like the most and eventually they purchase the product. The second scenario is a website offering a range of specialist finance solutions to businesses looking to lend money to buy a property. So your visitor navigates to the solution they think is most relevant to them. They engage with your content and they're interested in what you can offer. But they've never heard of you before and need to build up a little bit of trust first. So you show them a range of case studies of other businesses in similar scenarios that you've um, that have used this solution to purchase a commercial property. They browse through several case studies and decide that you are a credible lender before engaging with you by filling out an inquiry form. In both scenarios, in two, complete, in two completely different industries, you've rightly assumed that the customer isn't quite ready to purchase and you've provided an opportunity for them to continue flowing through the content of your website. That allows them to take the most relevant channels. Number five personalization. This ties in very nicely with content flow, especially if we're talking about visitors taking the most relevant channels. Personalization allows you to build up a picture of what your website visitors are most interested in um, and, and serving the most relevant content back to them. Personalization works and it works because the more relevant your experience, the more relevant your brand appears to be to each person visiting your website. There are two main ways to deliver personalized content to your audience. Both methods, methods require a little bit of information gathering first before you can really get moving. The first way is to store a cookie in your browser, uh, in the user's browser, which identifies the types of categories of content they've been looking at on your site. The more visits they make, the more data it builds up and the more personalized the content will be. The second method is a little less personal, but it uses collective data to understand what your audience prefers, generally speaking. It's also a little bit more complicated, but here's the way we like to do it. Implementing a tool such as Algolia to allow users to search your website, you can collect data on the types of content that people prefer collectively. 
you're essentially gathering data to prove that people who typically search for, let's say, retirement mortgages also search for annuities. Therefore, anyone browsing content related to retirement mortgages should be shown content related to annuities. Personalization is content flow on another level. Whichever method you choose, it can be a really powerful tool to help drive more leads or purchases via your website. Number six, Content Hub. How do you create some of the most relevant content that gets shown as a result of personalization and content flow? Well, a better question still is how do you rank well for keywords in your industry that very few other people are ranking for and that help you genuinely answer the questions that your audience is asking? A content hub is a really powerful marketing tool and sometimes a really quick way of helping you to achieve um, page one rankings in Google and other search engines by producing and publishing really useful content. For me, content hubs are like the hidden secrets of the marketing world across our client base from um, from law firms to banks to tech brands. We've experienced considerable success in creating a space for brands to explain the products and services in more detail and address the concerns of their respective marketplaces. Number seven, repeatability, particularly for similar content. So what makes for easy content management um, of content such as blog posts, team members, events, and content hubs? Well, it's simple, it's repeatability. So this is an area in which WordPress is absolutely king. The easier the job of creating your content on a regular basis, particularly the types of content that are similar in nature and follow a particular format, the more likely you are to actually update the content and as a result the more relevant your, your brand is likely to be. By contrast, if you're responsible for designing the page layout of this content each time, it'll take you far longer to create and publish new content and what's worse is that the content will be very inconsistent in its design from one post to the next or from one team member profile to the next whatever content you're creating. Take advantage of functionality such as custom post types in WordPress to properly organize segment, categorize, and tag the content, um, and your well-organized marketing will leave you with absolutely no regrets. Number eight, brand continuity. This leads us smoothly onto the continuity of your brand. Publishing repeatable content is an incredibly easy way to keep good continuity. But what about when it comes to pages where you have a little bit more or perhaps a lot more free reign? The old guard of content management systems were notorious for just letting you do whatever the heck you wanted and leaving you to figure it out. You most likely remember, or perhaps are still dealing with, um, trying to get your text to stop surrounding an image uh, that you just put on a page and somehow get it to display on the front end of your website without looking completely weird. Uh, a good content management system designed and engineered in collaboration with a good agency will give you all the scope to create your own content while maintaining brand integrity and brand continuity. What do I actually mean by this? Well, for example, the WordPress platform now has the Gutenberg block editor. The editor allows you to create, um, it allows us to create block options such as like images, bunches of text, call to action buttons, all with options that align with your brand. When built properly, you can't run away and add a bright, neon green button to a section with a rich red background. Um, you're also not worrying about where the next, uh, where the text, text and images sit. Um, and so you're not pasting random HTML code into a page in the hope that things will finally line themselves up properly. In this example um, that I'm showing here, the content editor only needs to upload an image, not specifically Photoshop the image into a circular shape in order to be in line with the brand. This is what an intuitive, well-built editor should work like. Number nine, flexibility and control over your content. Does having a content editor with continuity in mind mean that your CMS editing experience is rigid? It really shouldn't, to be honest. Likewise, does this mean the most useful kind of CMS will leave you reliant upon your web agency to change things for you? Absolutely not. This may be number nine on the list, but I may as go as far as to say that it, it's probably the number one thing that you should be looking for in a CMS. 
especially if your web platform, uh, if you view your web platform as an asset to your brand. Too often I speak to marketers and hear things such as I can't update my navigation or I need to ask my agency to update the text in the hero on the home page. And these sorts of conversations are not the sign of a content of a good content platform uh, or, or one that's implemented well. The power of your content management as a marketer or website owner really should be in your hands. So please bear that in mind. Number 10, landing page creation. Along um, very similar lines and still talking about the control and flexibility that you have within your website. Are you able to create your own campaign landing pages? If you're currently in the process of planning a website, make sure you factor in landing pages that can get the best out of your marketing campaigns. Doing this will allow you to create the most relevant content for the campaign you're running. And if you're creating a PPC ad on Google about a specific service you offer, with control of your landing pages, you can ensure the content um, of a unique page for that campaign aligns perfectly with the, with the content of your advert. Your visitors should feel like they've actually landed on the content they were looking for, not landing on a random page of your website because you were just trying to advertise to them. Tricking users into landing on your website and viewing semi-relevant content will actually drive up your cost per click and drive down the level of engagement with your ads. So just be careful. Number 11, video. So on the subject of landing pages, are you using video? Statistics suggest that using video on websites to explain your product or service can increase the conversion rates by 100%. So who wouldn't like double the amount of inquiries? I do have a caveat though when it comes to video. Make sure the video is controllable and not forced upon your audience. The, the use of clickable video is much more likely to engage people fully in that content, especially when there's audio to accompany it. But try to avoid auto playing a video and especially avoid auto playing audio. I've definitely been caught out a few times with my volume on Max and a video on a website that I wasn't expecting to start blasting out an advert. Of course, there is a performance based reason why you should also consider embedding your videos through services such as YouTube, Vimeo or Wistia, which is that background videos need to be a decent file size in order to work and can seriously degrade the performance of your website, which, of course, is a key ranking factor for Google. Number 12, calls to action. Any good website, in my experience, will feature at least one strong call to action. But the websites that seem to perform at a greater level are those with more regular opportunities to convert. Now, we don't just want to shove the same call to action in front of the user repeatedly. So the way around this is to ensure that you have variable designs for your calls to action in order to subtly remind the user and give them regular opportunities to convert from someone who's browsing to someone who's engaging. A call to action doesn't need to be an inquiry. Of course, it can also be a newsletter or event sign up with the aim to convert them to a paying customer later down the line after several engagements with your brand. Number 13, mobile calls to action. More specifically on mobile devices, you have a unique opportunity to encourage your website users to engage with you. A really simple but incredibly effective way to implement a call to action on mobile devices is to have, a, uh, have it stick to the bottom of the viewport. This handy prompt will then follow the user around the website. It's a really useful reminder of how they can engage with you. Taking it one step further, and you can implement different calls to action on different pages while remaining in prime position at the bottom of the viewport. So for example, most pages may encourage someone to simply inquire with you, whereas a specific product or service page may instead encourage someone to inquire about that specific product or service in which case the messaging of the call to action should change accordingly. Number 14, performance. This might seem like a really simple point to make, but you really need your website to be one of the highest performance sites possible. I'm talking about site speed, of course, and we need, we, we've already talked about a little bit about the attention spans and particularly on mobile devices. Google's put a lot of effort into making sure developers and marketers alike and both respect the experience that someone has when using your site 
And um, and a lot of this comes down to um, how quickly your content is served to them on their device. Google Page Speed Insights is one of the tools that we use at Illustrate Digital to understand how Google rates your website. And we know that speed is a ranking factor for Google. But the world's biggest search engine, in our experience, does also prioritize whatever is the best for the user. So whichever content management system you use and whichever agency you work with to implement it, performance must be a priority for all parties involved. Number 15, on-site SEO. We talked earlier about the power of being, uh, the power being in your hands from a content perspective. Equally as important is your level of control over your search engine optimization from within your content management platform. Granted, there are a lot of external tools to both feed into and monitor your SEO performance, but nothing quite influences your content like the platform it's hosted on. The most used and perhaps most well-known on-site SEO tool in the world uh, in the world is Yoast. Um, unsurprisingly, it's also the most installed plugin in the entire WordPress ecosystem. And it's our recommended and go-to tool for ensuring that on a page-by-page -page basis, your content is built to perform. There are, few, uh, there are a few crucial things that I would say to you that you need from your on-site SEO tool. These are influence over your page titles and page descriptions, the ability to change the image shown on social media platforms on a page-by-page -page basis, a simple way to benchmark your content against your keywords for that page, and finally, a way of benchmarking the readability of your content to ensure that you're able to benefit a wider audience of people. Number 16, correct schema data. And this is only a very quick and simple one, but quite oftentimes is missed, which is to ensure that the correct schema data has been implemented across um, your site in order to help search engines to identify the particular um, pieces of content. It typically covers data such as your address, phone number, any jobs you're advertising for, events you're running and snippets for your long tail articles. Number 17, well-structured URLs. One quick way to throw your search engine potential out of the window when it comes to your content uh, management platform is to mess up your URL structure. URLs should follow a natural hierarchy for your content. Subservices should be nestled beneath services and so on. To phrase it a different way, if you leave all of your website content on the highest level URL, you're telling both Google and your website audience that all of your content is as important as other pieces of content. In other words, without a clear hierarchy, there's no way to properly understand or prioritize what each page of your website is for and what it relates to. Number 18, a good footer, and most of you are probably gonna laugh at this, but don't underestimate the footer of your website. Uh, as a website user, it's one of my go-to tools when I'm looking for something about a brand um, usually something a little bit obscure, like a data retention policy or information about the leadership team. But I have a phrase when it comes to website footers, which is, um, you know, it, it, it essentially provides more perspective um, and, and it's content assurance. Um, this is the notion that you've written and displayed content that provides good assurance to your users. And a strong footer with useful content can make brands both big and small feel trustworthy. So use it for ways to get help to explain your equality and diversity policies, outline your delivery schedules and anything you feel may give more assurance to your users and your audience. Number 19, accessibility. So let me ask a question. How high or low is the barrier to entry for your website? Does it include as many people as possible as part of the experience? Unfortunately, many still overlook accessibility as one of the absolute foundations and proving points of a good website. You should be actively aiming to include as many users as you possibly can, whilst, of course, still creating a great, vibrant experience. And it's accessibility is often seen as the same category as disability. But in reality, it's a case of allowing as many different people to access as much of your content as they possibly can and in turn, allowing people to engage with your brand. And number 20, sustainability. It's last, but by certainly no means least, and that's the sustainability of your website. I'm not talking about eco-friendly sustainability, although that's definitely important. I'm talking about the lifespan of your website. In years gone by, it was a standard practice to replace a website roughly every three to five years, but 
that's no longer considered good practice and for good reason, because it's wasteful. Your website should be uh, ideally built with a good enough foundation that it becomes a true asset to your business and it gains value over time. As front end designs become tired, they should be refreshed. And in an ideal world, brands would buy into a continuous process of learning and improvement and one that sees the user experience change month to month, year on year, to the point that you wouldn't recognize it as the same brand from years previous. So um, that's me. The, the, the truth is not every website, not every desire is covered by a single content management system, ultimately. And for marketing teams who require greater flexibility with their campaigns and content, a secondary CMS like WordPress or like any of the other platforms we're talking about may help with some of the areas we've spoken about here today. And if you do need help with any of those areas, please get in touch with Figaro Digital, ask them to put us in touch, or check us out directly at illustrate.digital, and we'll be happy to chat about this in more detail. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this content and found it useful. Uh, please let me know what you've taken away from today's content.